All right, trucking unicorn back in the building. It's been a hot minute, ma'am. It's been a couple years. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, and I'm. I apologize for uh, the late catch up. Um, but I see that you been busy. Uh, last time we talked, uh, you was a. Uh, you you was a company driver as well as a as a, a bodybuilding competition type female, but life is lifing and changes has changed. Uh, get me caught up to what you've been up to as of late. Uh, well, since the last time we talked, I bought a truck. I bought a 2003 379 with a 99 6NZ cap motor. Um, just been trucking. You know, I went from dry van to flatbed. So that's been uh, an adventure in itself. And yeah, um, I don't know, probably the last six to eight months with the switch and the transition over into flatbed. And well, as we all know, rate's not great right now. Um, it's been a little more focus on trucking and a little less on being consistent in the gym, uh, which my body has informed me is not okay with that. So um, I don't like the discomfort that I feel when I'm not in the gym. Like physically, my body hurts. So that's just my body telling me, hey, get your poop in a group and get back on the grind. So well, first thing first, you brought a truck. I did. Considering the 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 way trucking has been, what what made you buy the what made you buy the truck? Considering the fact that you know trucking is going the way it's going right now. Um, I bought my truck in July of 2021. Um, and I just, I always knew ever since I very first got in my first company truck as an OTR driver, um, I climbed in that truck and my brain said, you are not made for this. You are not made to be a company driver. Um, I'm not made to be told where to go, when to go, how to go. No, that's not, that's not who I am. So I always knew that I was going to buy a truck. So in my head, at that time, I was uh, 41, and I said, you know, I'm going to own a truck before the age of 45. And I just set in motion my plan to buy my truck. So, you know, I set my life up in order to make that happen. So I minimized all of my household bills. And I just put every penny away that I could. I didn't spend any extras on anything that wasn't a necessity, anything that wasn't, you know, food or a household bill. So that's just what I did. And then when I bought my truck, I knew it was going to be hard, but I had myself set up pretty well. I put 10,000 down on my truck. I had 10,000 in the bank to cover, you know, hopefully uh, mild to moderate repairs along with fuel before your first, you know, owner operator checks start coming in. That's just, that was my plan from the time I got in a company truck. So explain to me how was that possible? You you don't have any kids? You uh, are you are you married or had any kids or anything like that? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know this is excuse me. A damn fine cup of coffee. I've had, I can't tell you how many cups of coffee in my life, and this, this is one of the best. Uh, I'm not, and uh, all three of my sons are grown. They are uh, 28, 24, and 19. That's how you was able to minimize all of your uh, expenses and responsibilities. Uh, out of all of that, was you still able to, like, keep your home, or you... You gave up your home as well. No, I actually have a place in Minnesota. Uh, my brother, my oldest son, and my youngest son, 
and I all share a place. Um, I just only go to my house probably three, four times a year by choice. Okay. I mess with Minnesota. Shout out to Minnesota, man. That hey, every time I get a chance, I, I know it's the I know the weather is like horrible, but every time I get a chance to go up to Minnesota, you know, I I, I pretty much enjoy it. You knew from a company status that you you wanted to own your truck. You started, you say you started saving everything. How hard was it to save? Like, I mean, there there had to be times like, oh, man, I, I want to get this purse or, oh, man, I want to get this or something like that or splurge or something like that. How was you able to to get a mindset of just, hey, I'm going to put all this in the bank and I'm just going to just let it ride until I need Till I need to meet my goal. Um, honestly, if you want something bad enough, nothing's ever going to stand in your way. So my goal of owning a truck was far greater than my desire to buy myself new jeans or new leggings or something that I didn't, you know, everything that I would typically shop for clothes, shoes, whatever I already had. So it was more desirable for me to own a truck than it was to fill that instant gratification of going to the store and buying myself something new that I already had. What about the decision to buy the truck? Why, why did you chose uh, the route you took to buy the truck? than taking a route that everybody else seems to be taking as leasing to purchase the truck. What was your mindset on that? Because most lease purchases are not set up to benefit the driver. Exactly. Exactly. I, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Now that you went in, purchased the truck, how how long how long was the process of going in purchasing the truck all the way up to receiving the truck so the company i was working for was a really small company i was their first uh, over the road driver uh it was the company i was working for the last time we talked a few years ago they knew exactly what kind of truck i wanted and they actually bought the truck and I put the down payment down and my payments were $300 a week with zero interest. And I could pay off it. I could pay it off at any point in time without penalty. You know, it was just, I was very lucky that they carried basically the financing per se. So essentially it was a lease purchase, but it wasn't through any of these other big companies you know, where you pay $700 a week and then have a $40,000 balloon payment at the end. That was not what I set myself up with. Are you still with that, that company or no? No, I actually uh, paid off the truck after a year. And that's when I went um, over with 5F. I don't know if you ever saw any of the videos I made with them pulling that big yellow trailer that said 5F on it. I'm not sure. Who 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 you went with again? I'm sorry. I was with a company called 5F. Oh, 5F. So they, the number 5F? Yep. yep. Okay. And um, they had a really good... That's where I learned to book and dispatch myself. So I started out with them because originally I was obviously being dispatched by the company that I was with. Well, when I went to 5F, I decided to book and dispatch myself. So I had access to all their boards and I would just find myself a load paying what I wanted it to pay, going where I wanted to go. So I learned the negotiations that you have to go through when you're dealing with brokers. Um, I was in control. If I wanted to take a week off, I took a week off. If I wanted to run seven days a week, I ran seven days a week. If I wanted to have time for the gym, I had time for the gym. 
Um, so that was when I had the most control over what it is that I was doing in trucking. And I think that's honestly why I've been able to do so well. Because if I book a load that's on a tight schedule, I don't have anybody to be mad at but myself because I did that to myself. If I decide to take a load that's a little bit less paying than what I'd like it to pay, I don't have anybody to blame but myself. But I also know that that's my best option to get me to a better area where I can get a better paying load. So when I was being booked and dispatched by somebody else, I would get mad at them because I didn't have the control. I wasn't seeing what they were seeing. I wasn't in my head, this can't be the best option. But when you're doing it yourself, you know, because you're seeing the numbers and you don't have anybody to be mad at but yourself. And it takes, in my opinion, for me, it takes a lot of the stress and the aggravation out of it. Yeah, it's stressful and it's aggravating to haul a load that pays two bucks a mile versus 250 or three or whatever your goal is. But you are the one in control. So you understand this is what you have to do right now instead of somebody else telling you this is what you have to do right now. Wow. Okay. So all of this, your whole journey from, from getting the truck to now dispatching yourself and everything, all this is self-taught, right? You, you didn't, you, you didn't buy into any, class to to learn how to buy a truck or to learn how to dispatch or anything like that this this is all self-taught right um for the most part yes uh from the time i became a company driver i surrounded myself with other owner operators so it was surround yourself with the people who are doing what it is that you want to do in the way that you want to do it and learn from them. Ask questions. How, why, when, what does that type of repair sound like? What happens if you don't do it? And just ask questions. The only way you're going to learn is by asking questions of people who are in the position that you want to be in. That's great. That's great. You ha- Have you ever thought about buying into any of those uh online courses or anything like that? No. I didn't even know there wasn't any to be honest with you. Yeah, there there's a lot. There is a lot. Here, let me show you how to dispatch with just a calculator, a computer, and the internet. Give me fifty dollars half off and I can show you how. It's pretty self ex Explanatory. I mean, you get on the board, you put in where it is that you're at. If you want to go to a specific area, you put in where it is you want to go. And then it shows you loads and you look at them and you decide is the weight versus the mileage versus the pay, is it worth it? Is it even close to where I want to be? Because you got to start with something that's close to the amount that you want. Like you can't call on a load that's listed for a buck 50 a mile and be like i want 250 they're absolutely going to tell you no and they're going to hang up on you so you got to start with a load that's somewhere close to what it is that you want and then you just call them up and you ask the details and then you get into your negotiation phase you always start higher than where you want to be that way you have negotiating room i mean that's just that's the key components to negotiation everybody's negotiated something in their life at some point you just take those skills and you apply them to the brokers. And if they say no, you hang up on them and you go to the next one. There's no need to argue with these guys. They want to argue with you. They want to wear you down. And you just, you don't let them. You would already have an idea uh, idea fee that you, that you won't go less than. But when you start the the negotiations, you'll start higher than, and then you'll just work down to what you want, right? Right. Because if you, it's like going to buy a car 
And if you want to pay, old school pay, $25,000 for a car, um, than what they want. You know, they're going to tell you, oh, well, this car's $35,000. And you try to whittle them down while they try to get you to come up. That's all it is. It's the same thing. It's like if you're selling something on Facebook Marketplace, you list it for more than you want because you know that they're going to negotiate with you. Hence the or best offer that's listed on anything that you purchase from a private seller or even from, you know, a car sales place or whatever it is. It's all about negotiation. So have you ever thought about getting your own authority? Damn good coffee and hot. I actually looked into it. Um, I am not a paperwork person. I absolutely hate paperwork and I have no time, um, patience or tolerance for it. Like, we all know our 2290s do at the end of August every year. And it inevitably is like October 15th. And I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and when I remember to pay my 2290, I'm terrible with paperwork. So I found a company that would file all the paperwork, DOT, MC, uh, they'd set up your drug consortium. They literally, they'd set up your IFTA, everything. They'd even file your IFTA for you every quarter. Um, so I talked to them about setting all that up, and then I talked to my insurance company about getting insurance, and just the initial startup was $8,000 because the down payment for insurance was so high because uh, you got to pay the down payment and whatever it is the first month of insurance unless you pay your insurance annually. So the initial cost is extremely high, not to mention... Most brokers are not going to work with you on a brand new MC. They want three months or six months. Some of them want a year or two. And the only way that your MC is going to mature is if you keep insurance on it. So in my head, paying, I think I was quoted $3,200 a month insurance for an MC after the initial cost just to let it mature and run under somebody else's MC while mine matures didn't make any sense financially. Not in this market right now, at least. Let's uh, switch gears over to what you're hauling now. You, you started out as, you know, as a van driver, um, but now you're, you're a flatbed girl. What was the uh, what was the lure of becoming a flatbed driver? That was actually always my goal. Um, I never really wanted to haul reefer or dry van or anything like that. My goal was always to do flatbed because, um, again, we've talked about it before, competitive bodybuilding. So, being that I love fitness and physical fitness and physical work flatbedding just made the most sense to me. Why wouldn't I flatbed? That is what's called functional movement, chaining and strapping. Everything you're doing is you're using your body in a functional way to do everyday activities. So you combine those functional movements with the movements in the gym and you're getting a more well-rounded, um, aesthetically pleasing physique. So working out and making money at the same damn time. That's what's up. That's right. So you, so you already said, and we have talked about that in, a, uh, in the past, but it, was there any inspiration behind you uh, jumping on flatbed? Like, did you see any other women flatbedding and you was like, oh, okay, well, you know. No, actually, I didn't. Um, I know that there's very few women. There are women in flatbed. There's women in oversized and heavy haul, but there's not a lot of them. So I hadn't actually run across that. It was just my whole goal and focus was physical fitness and doing what I love to do, which is trucking. So are you are are you specialized now in flatbed? Uh, you know, over I mean, uh, overweight overhaul all that good stuff or are you just 
you know, no. just drive a regular skateboard. Just regular skateboard. Trucking unicorn, getting it in, man. Again, thank you very much for uh, sitting back down with me, man. I know it's been a minute, and I'm enjoying uh, catching up with you right now. Uh, of course, about a year ago, you had a situation at a truck stop. It was kind of scary. Uh, you you made a TikTok about it. Some guy was trying to get your attention. So this guy right here tried to flag me down outside of my truck. Walked up to my truck, tried to flag me down. Got in his truck, which was parked on the other side of that extra truck. Pulled around and then drove over here and parked next to me and proceeded to flag me to roll down my window so he could ask me, how about you and me later tonight? Like, what the fuck? Why don't you get out of your truck at night, they asked. Motherfucker! That's fucking why! Like, he literally, I said to him, just because you wanna fuck me doesn't mean that I wanna fuck you. Would you walk into the store? Would you just ask some girl randomly that question? No, the fuck you wouldn't. So why would you ask me? Cause I'm a driver? That ain't fucking, that don't mean shit. What the fuck is wrong with these motherfuckers? And now, Chrome has got to go pee, and guess who can't get the fuck out of their truck? Why? Because fuck stick over here has got me freaked the fuck out. I paid for parking already, and I'm not trying to go down the road to try to find parking in a place where there ain't going to be any parking anyway. Fuck. Motherfuckers, I swear to God. Take us, take us back to what happened that night. Um, I was down in Texas, actually, at one of my favorite truck stops. And it's a paid parking lot, part of the reason why I go there. Um, and I had come out from my shower, and it was after dark, but it's a well-lit parking lot. Walked to my truck, got in my truck, and I, I'm actually sitting in the driver's seat on the phone with my mom, talking to my mom, and I see this guy walking up towards my truck. And he's in front of my truck and he's like trying to wave at me. So I kind of scrunched down in the seat like, um, it's dark. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to engage with this guy. Um, and then he walks over to the driver's side of the truck and tries to get my attention through the window. He never knocks on the door or anything, but he's trying to, he's like waving his arms, like trying to get my attention. He walks down the driver's side of my truck so that I can actually see him in my driver's mirror and continues walks. I still ignore him, walks all the way around in front of my truck over to the passenger side, tries to get my attention from the window, then walks down the passenger side, tries to, you know, get my attention in the mirror. And I just continued to ignore him because it just, there was that instinct, you know, the intuition that tells you this is probably not a good thing. Um, he goes, he gets in his truck, which he was parked in the row in front of me, pulls out, comes into the parking lot where I'm at, and backs in next to me on the passenger side of my truck, which was an empty spot. And I'm still sitting there on the phone with my mom, and I kind of have my head down. And I can see him out of my peripheral, like, trying to get my attention through the window. And I'm on the phone with my mom, and he's in his truck at this point. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'll appease him maybe it's something else you know maybe it's uh hey i follow you on social media um so i roll down the window and he's like hey how are you doing i was like i'm all right he's like so how about you and me later tonight and i just i looked at him and it it never ceases to amaze me like i know that these guys some of these guys are like this and i don't judge all male truck drivers by the few that are weird and creepy and stalkerish. When you repeatedly try to get my attention and I ignore you and then you are persistent, that's when it becomes creepy slash stalkerish. I'm not upset that he wanted to talk to me. If he wanted to talk to me like a normal person, like, hey, I follow you on social media or, hey, I really like your truck or whatever, that's fine. I'm nice to everybody. But when you presume that because you're a boy and I'm a girl 
and you have an Audi and I have an Innie and you're attracted to me, so therefore I should be attracted to you, that's when I have a problem. Like, these people aren't going to walk up to a lady working in the truck stop and say, hey, how about you and me later tonight? No, it doesn't work that way. So just because I'm a truck driver doesn't mean that that gives you the right to treat me with any level of disrespect or to um, outwardly sexually objectify me. Um, I don't think anybody should be outwardly sexually objectified. Unfortunately, our society today, um, a lot of people allow that behavior. And so, hence the idea that that's acceptable. Weird. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Awful. I, I I mean, there's there's plenty of other words that I can that I that I can say about this gentleman. I mean, bro, this this is not a good look for you, my guy. I mean, it just makes you it just makes you weird and creepy. And now you you're you're up in the truck. You're by yourself. He's parked next to you. Now you're afraid to get out of the truck. Like, yep. My dog, my, my dog was a puppy at that time. So obviously he was not a very good guard dog when he was just a couple of months old. So, and he had to go to the bathroom. So I literally had to sit there and wait for this guy to either leave or go to bed before I could take my dog out and feel comfortable. Wow. In the video, you said you didn't leave, but why didn't you leave? I mean, why, why? I, I know you paid for your parking, but, you know, you could have probably, you know, got your money back up under extenuous circumstances, but why didn't you leave? Well, it wasn't even necessarily so much about the $10 for parking. It was like 10 o'clock at night. And going down the road to another truck stop to find parking at 10 o'clock at night is not something I was, A, going to do, and B, the likelihood of, we all know, how many places are you going to find parking at 10 o'clock at night? Yeah, not not that many. And I, you know, exactly. I, I'm just looking out for your safety. That's, that's why I didn't know. That's what my question was at, but... Of course, you know, your doors was locked and everything like that. Do you do you have uh you know, do you have personal well being that this is your own truck, are you able to keep your own personal pew pew with you now? I did not have one at the time. All I had was like a nice um one of those retractable um police issue batons and some um, mace. And a taser. Um, that's all I had at that time. I now have my own pew pew for obvious reasons. Um, so, you know, you just you do what you got to do to keep yourself safe. But I'm also not going to let the few, we'll say few, because I'm I'm being polite. The few weird, awkward, inappropriate stalkery creepers um deter me from doing what it is that i love to do so of course night turns into morning uh was he still there or was he gone or did you leave first no he left he was not there um even later in the evening he wasn't there so i don't know if he had stopped for a 30 minute break or a, a two-hour sleeper birth. I don't know. I didn't stay and pay attention. You know, I hibernated in my bunk at that point. What's your advice to women in situations like that? So being, um, it's not even necessarily being a woman in the industry. It's just the industry in general. You need to have a teaspoon of gangster in you to do this job. We're in different cities and different states all the time. 
And while uh, tracking, you know, everybody's got Live 360 or some kind of app on their loved ones so that they can see where they're at and all of that. Still, it's hours before people realize you might be missing or something may have happened to you. So you have to have a teaspoon of gangster in you to be able to do this job and do it successfully, I guess, you know, by keeping yourself safe. I'm not talking financial success. I'm talking about personal safety and well-being success. Um, but for other women, I would say know your surroundings. Always know your surroundings. Be aware of uh, what trucks are parked where, who's sitting in the driver's seat, what do they look like, what are they wearing. Uh, when you walk through the parking lot, don't be on your phone. Anybody who's looking for a victim is looking for somebody who is not a confident person. And you can tell by you can tell just by the way people carry themselves. If you go to the mall and you look at the people that are walking around, you can pick out the confident people versus the insecure people. Um, so carry yourself with confidence. Stand tall. Keep your head up. Don't be on your phone. Don't have distractions. And more or less have your head on a swivel. Constantly be looking around at who's where, who's doing what, and know your surroundings. Because when you are diligent in that, it shows to somebody who's looking for a victim. They're not going to come up and approach somebody who's standing tall with their head up, um, alert and aware of the surroundings and situations, because that person can give details what they look like, what they were wearing, where they were parked, what they were driving, and they don't want that. They want a victim, somebody who's not going to be able to answer questions if they don't, if they're not successful in doing what it is that they want to do to you. Trucking Unicorn, thank you very much for your time, man. This was a beautiful catch-up. It was good chatting with you. Every day for the last 10 years, Loretta there has been giving me a large black coffee. Today she gives me a large black coffee, only it's got sugar in it. A lot of sugar. I just came back to complain. How you boys put those guns down? Let me bring this back in. Where where were you when, when uh, I-35 collapsed? Uh, I was living in Arizona. Okay. So yeah, I didn't move up there until 2011. Okay, okay, okay. So you wasn't you you wasn't around when that happened. Nope. Did you do you see any type of news or or did you find out all about that until after you moved up there? I had a friend that lived in Minnesota. So she had told me about it. She told me about it because she was super creeped out because she had literally, like, 30 minutes prior to the bridge collapsing, had driven across the bridge. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, but other than that, like, I don't think, I wasn't even there, like, during the George Floyd riot. I was out on the road. I was never home for any of the chaos that happened. Um, I wasn't there when the roof on the Metrodome collapsed from all the snow. I wasn't there for the I-35 bridge. I wasn't there when that uh, that tanker driver, which we talked about one time, um, came across the bridge where all the protesters were. Like, I was never home during that. The run, the boat, the pack of tequila, I mix it all up and I swear that I need none of them. My pocket if it ain't about the wild, none of them. My mind if it ain't about the time, none of them. My wrist if it ain't about the time, no raise, none of them. No, we gon' be fine. There's so many battles on my left and my right. Hey, take a shot for all of your problems. We ain't worried about them tonight. It's called shot by.